All right, the battle is on, but in this video, it's all gonna be settled. As if dog training could ever be settled. Dog trainers love to argue, will argue about everything. Lures versus shapers. Um, of course, that's a little bit of a false dichotomy because most dog trainers maybe use a little bit of both. Most dog trainers are definitely dominant to one side. So I hope this video possibly opens up the door for you to start improving the side that you're uh, least comfortable with and maybe have a better idea of why each one is done um, at different areas. And also probably the most important thing, what the issues are with both of these things. Where trainers fail and give the other side ammo to say that that way is just not effective or is inferior. We need to first start off by defining it because in my vast search of the interwebs, I did come across a lot of, uh, well, let's say not so accurate information as to the definition. Luring, for the sake of kind of arguing the science behind this stuff, luring is like having the food close to the dog and showing them the way with the food. Uh, luring is not the dog following a target stick. So within shaping a popular method as a target stick, that is not luring. Or let's say if you walk a certain direction so that you know the dog's gonna uh, touch something or you know step on something or go through something and you wanna mark that, you didn't lure the dog with your body movement. So luring specifically means the dog is kind of receiving feedback from that food and that's gonna come in super important later when we talk about uh, how dogs receive happiness and, and how their, their drive works towards achieving that happiness. So when food is on the nose or being fed even to lead the dog around, that is what's going to constitute luring. Shaping, or if you want to say free shaping, does not involve luring with the food. Rather, it involves rewarding after the behavior is done, typically for small progressions that become final behaviors. That's called successive approximation. So getting closer and closer. But the big misconception that I would say my community of balance trainers has is that you know to teach a dumbbell you're going to put the dumbbell on the other side of the room and wait for the dog to walk over near the dumbbell um, i think most balanced trainers believe that free shaping is leaving a lot more to the dog than uh the actual reality so the people at the top who are shaping and, and have really nice results they are setting up their environment to really help them get through that process quicker okay now let's take a look at some of their applications their benefits and where it all goes wrong First, we're going to go over luring, some of the applications, and why I think luring still has its place in the dog training world. The first thing that comes to mind with luring is getting a proper rhythm within the healing. So uh, shaping the dog to heal, of course, I can get great position. Um, I can you know, have the eye contact. I can do all that great stuff. But what luring does is it allows me to get that exact floaty rhythm I like in the healing. It also allows me to have a follow so I can work on those motions outside of healing. And again, you might say, yeah, but Sarah, you could just use a, he a, a target stick for that. The issue with the target stick and doing a, a follow with it, especially if you're coaching people, it's not dummy proof. So if I want, I have to click the exact timing for that. When you're rewarding for a follow, you just drop the food. It's pretty easy. Uh, even if the dog had looked away or you know gotten out of position still the dropping of the food is going to reinforce that area just like spitting food from eye contact as opposed to clicking it and rewarding it spitting is just more dummy proof the fact that it's falling from that area um, is going to reinforce it
Follow. Stay. Choo. Good boy. Stay. Choo. Stay. So what that means is when I'm, you know, having somebody back up and they've got their follow hand up, I want to make sure that dog stays straight um, because a lot of dogs, what they do in the follow, they naturally want to make eye contact with the handler. And then you can have the butt drift out a little bit, which of course we don't want to create that habit. But at the same time, we don't want to have to work on it while we're trying to work on our emotions. So rather than, you know, mess something up potentially, you have your, your target hand, which the dog has been conditioned to look at. You you can have it as low or as high as you want and that having it low or high also makes a huge difference in their the speed of their learning we're going to talk about that again later when we talk about timing and dopamine um, but I can have my hand up here and and I don't have to tell a client oh you reward at the wrong time no just uh, hey two out of three drop food instead of asking for a sit or a down that way we do what's called feed the follow we're rewarding the dog for you know following not just the motion otherwise they start to anticipate the motion and they'll start to have a little bit of a disconnection so we feed that follow feed that follow do a motion feed that follow four times do another sit or a down the other reason I always want a dog I can adjust into position is because I might not actually want the dog to offer something and I have a couple examples of that with my little princess my little hairless angel sorry I'll stop talking baby talk um, she's so sensitive and she She's just, she's such a princess that if I asked her, you know, just with my body language suggested to, for her to do a heel and that flip finish, she ended up halfway on slippery floors, it would spook her. And finally, probably the main reason I still use luring in my training um, is the same reason I'm going to later argue for shaping. And that is because the dog is not really aware of what's going on during luring. I can layer my leash pressure on just a flat collar on a puppy as young as eight weeks old because it's not, they're not really noticing it. Um, it's a light leash pressure and it's an immediate lure down. So I'm showing the dog, hey, when you feel this prompt, when you feel this feeling here that's the uh, reaction you want and yes I'm building that in so you know when the dog is super well trained and maybe I'm doing some proofing I can apply a correction uh I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. We're not going to get into the balanced versus R plusers right now. That's a video that's coming up. I still believe in the trenches using some of the more simple methods um, can help dogs more. And again, different video, different time. But I do use those corrections and I want a client to be able to give their dog a little pop pop and the dog goes, oh, I know exactly what to do. Teaching a dog how to yield to leash pressure without that extreme focus on something else is riskier, especially again, if you're teaching uh, students or you're teaching other trainers. This method gives it a very foolproof, you're not gonna mess up the dog because if the dog resists at all, that means you put too much pressure. So any resistance, any opposition response, you're doing that layering wrong. So for me, again, teaching young trainers or teaching clients, it's a pretty foolproof method to teach a dog how to yield to that pressure, which I also believe is an important life skill, whether uh, the dog is a pet dog or a sport dog you don't know who's going to be dealing with your dog at the vet you don't know if your dog gets loose they need to be able to accept not just you know holding but actually guiding and and understand that that's not a bad thing let's talk about when luring goes really really wrong okay uh number one problem a lot of dogs you see luring are pretty poopy so they're pretty like mm, not all of them and of course you know the problem is is any method done poorly is going to look like crap. There's no method that you can tell me that if somebody doesn't miss those main points uh, is going to be effective.
it. So you're always going to have it done done incorrectly. And and a couple of the biggest problems I see when luring are one constant feeding. You can watch this in my luring 101 video to really show you how to uh, lure properly. But if you're feeding a dog and moving them around, they are absorbing like nothing. Okay. So there's a better way to lure. And that is with a closed fist, cl a clear mark, um, and really un get that dog to understand. They're just kind of hanging there. They're not bothering the hand and trying to eat. And again, that's absorption. They're not going to be absorbing what they're doing if they're trying to eat. The other area luring goes wrong is people just don't know how to, to stop using it. Whenever I use a lure, it might be, uh, one session for, for like, let's say one goal, it might be one session. I'm getting off that lure like really, really fast. There's a couple exceptions to this. Uh, healing might be one of them, especially if I have a dog who's like a pacer. There's some dogs that just have a hard time getting into good movement or they want to skip or they want to hop. And so anytime that's natural, then you're going to have to lure for longer. But with regards to doing some sort of, you know, skill, some sort of behavior, luring should just be a really small part of that. And the the shaper's argument is that uh, it's too easy for people to just lure and lure and lure and lure and lure. And you know what? They're not wrong, but I would argue, would those people be beautiful shapers? Um, I don't know if I actually think so. I think some people pick it up really quickly or they put more into it and they're going to recognize, especially if they have a good teacher. Okay. That's a huge factor. Um, but I think the people that, that are, they can't really be taught. It might actually be better for them to just lure. Okay. They're getting something. Maybe it's not, it's not as good as, you know, your really high level shaper, but I can promise you within the shaper community, there's some really bad shapers. There's just bad dog trainers and good dog trainers. Just like there's, you know, bad doctors and good doctors. That's just how life is. And we can't make every single person an amazing dog trainer. There's no method that's going to do that. Now, if you're listening to this podcast and you're a professional dog trainer, the chances are you're a balanced dog trainer. And I'm going to bet that you are not super comfortable with shaping within the balanced community. There, there seem to be fewer people, uh, really proficient in shaping than there are in the R plus community. I have my reasons for that. I don't know if I want to say it, I might get a lot of shit, but I would argue that we have as balanced trainers, the option of, uh, you know, physical compelling, however you want to call that corrections. That's not really all the, always what it is. Um, but anytime we're physically compelling the dog, we have that in our tool bag. Our plus people have different tools. And in my opinion, they have to know those tools better. So they have to be better at them to be effective because they, they can't really just grab a leash and, you know, make the dog do something as a general rule from what I see across the internet, uh, our plus people are definitely killing it in the shaping department more so than balanced. Come on guys, catch up, get with it. If you're still luring a dog to its place or worse, dragging it over there, um, you, 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 you really should modernize because you can get far better results incorporating shaping into your training. There's just no other method that produces such an open, uh, happy, yes. confident dog. So whenever I kind of have something, I'm going to go right back to shaping. Even if I lured it for, you know, three times, I'm going to go to shaping because, uh, you're just not going to get that joyful bounce to the bed. Of course, with some dogs, some dogs are just super resilient and they're just going to make you look good no matter what. But as a, a whole shaping is just going to produce a better attitude for the dog. I'm going to talk about two scenarios where I see luring being used really, really poorly. Probably my least favorite is over the jump, especially with a ball. So I see people luring a dog over a hurdle. Um, this teaches horrible jumping technique. You really want to shape your jump. You do not want to be luring it because the dog is learning to jump in a way that is uh, caca. And it might actually really hurt you later, especially when you're throwing a dumbbell. Well, that just looks like what you've been doing and they just lose their mind. Now they're going to pray and the jump just goes everywhere. They're not thinking about that jump because you never taught it. The other area where I see it being used that drives me nuts is luring something the dog finds scary. What happens is transfer. So if the dog is feeling uh, bad emotions while you're trying to like convince them to go up this really steep A-frame, 
you're transferring those bad emotions to your luring and the dog can start to go oh I don't trust you <laughs> stranger danger you know you're trying to lure in that you actually see them shutting down um, so if you have anything the dog is scared about shape it let them touch a foot chip throw let them touch two feet chip again you that a frame doesn't have to be across the field that's the hilarious thing I hear people talking about you know like it's this some unit the universe and the stars have to be in alignment you know for the dog to happen upon the right choice no we have brains let's use them let's set up our environment to where that happens a lot quicker um, so you know just your body movement or just the way that you position something can make a dog uh, show interest oh it's a sniff chip but you're gonna move through that way faster more importantly your dog's not gonna learn to second guess you you do not want to be teaching your dog that when you ask for something is too much for them all right so now let's talk about shaping and we're not just gonna talk about the good we're gonna talk about the really bad I'm gonna confess for me this is my weak spot this is the spot I'm really trying to improve on I actually just signed up for a Susan Garrett course so I'm super excited thank you Susan for letting me in that and I'm also gonna cite one of her podcasts that was um, really interesting that you guys are gonna want to check out that's her podcast on dopamine um, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit right here but I'll let you get it from the expert uh, she did a lot of research on this there's a reason most service dog companies now use exclusive shaping for their training and that is the dog thor more thoroughly learns the cue and is more uh, easily able to generalize more easily and is more able to generalize uh, once they've learned it so let's say your service dog uh, they need to go sit under a table or lay under a table but now there's some things blocking it or there's some problem solving uh, solving dogs who have been shaped are much better at figuring that out because of course they haven't had their hand held through all of it they're doing it all on their own and they have the confidence to back it up now let's talk about why you're getting that attitude of that joyful offer that we just love to see that's likely due to the timing of the dopamine release uh, again go watch that video but what happens is when people are starting to lure the dog is already getting uh, food input if you would say so they're already getting that kind of that reward especially for those of you who are feeding them during it and so that is coming prior to the behavior you're teaching with shaping the dog does it with no you know input nothing from the food and then BAM there's a dopamine burst when they get that food and that transfer happens to the behavior so that feeling then becomes transferred to the thing before it and that's why you see such a great attitude within that method It also helps create a much better trainer, at least for those who stick with it. But the argument could be made that for a lot of people, it's a little too challenging to kind of stomach at first, especially for, let's say, your average pet person. So you might find that trainers, if they weren't taught it properly or they weren't taught it earlier enough, they kind of shy away from it because of that complexity. And that can be damaging too. Shaping also helps create a trainer who has a really good understanding of timing and and not using help. That really can't be underestimated considering even when you're going to competition clubs or AKC clubs, you're seeing a lot of people helping the dog. Then they get into this trial, the dog doesn't do it, and they don't know why because the dog's never done that before, but you've watched them lure that dog around and you know that the dog has no idea how to do it without that help. So creating a better trainer is also a huge bonus. The things I use shaping for the most are definitely the dumbbell, uh, the jumping at any sort of targeting, any sort of direction or target, shaping is gonna be um, my go-to. With puppies, I'm also shaping a sit immediately. So I don't have to have food on me. Um, I could be, I remember many times blow drying my hair and Ricky would walk in and he would give me this like collapsing sit and look at me, you know, all lovey eyed. And I would stop what I was doing and just fawn all over him and tell him what a good boy he is. So for the sit, it's all also something that
something that especially in the early days I'm doing a lot of shaping later on again I'm doing it from the follow so I probably need more education on how I would do that shaping from a follow. There's a lot of things done in both luring and shaping that are pointed out as issues that are really just user error. So again, with any method, it can be done wrong, it will be done wrong. You kind of have to ask yourself, what fallout are you more willing to accept? The dog who can't do it without the lure, or maybe this dog spinning out and offering a thousand behaviors, or the owner just getting frustrated and giving up because it's a little too complicated. There's gonna be fallout from both, but again, ultimately that's user error. That being said, I do believe shaping is the superior way for the dog to learn. Unfortunately, those are not the only elements when we are training pet dogs or teaching other trainers. If that was the only element was the dog's ability to learn, uh, shaping definitely, ugh, by far superior. But there are other elements to consider, especially if you aren't R plus and you are layering any sort of e-collar or leash pressure, luring can be a perfect way to do that. Again, because they're not aware of what's happening. However, they're subconsciously taking that in. They are subconsciously learning, first of all, to accept it. Oh, that's nothing. This is literally the amount of pressure. That's nothing. Okay, it's totally fine. Wow, there's my jackpot of food. Um, and it, it helps us really get through that process pretty easily. What it comes down to for me is, is timing. So how much reward a dog is getting before the behavior versus after the behavior. And again, luring with a, especially if you want the dog absorbing something, luring with that closed fist and then a real jackpot with a lot of praise. I, I'm pretty sure you can still get a, a really solid dopamine. I don't need any more dopamine in my training. So I think I actually did that too much uh, with my last competition dog. And that's something to remember too, which is dog type. For dogs who have the propensity to spin out of control, shaping can be, a, I think, a little bit dangerous for especially for newer trainers that don't have it down even seasoned trainers can have a hard time with stimulus control that is not having the dog offer a thousand different things if you have somebody with timing that's not uh, quite right, you might get a really frustrated dog that's just like pushing and pushing and pushing more. So again, another downside, a downside to shaping, but again, it's user error. It's the trainer not rewarding uh, the duration of the behavior and potentially even accidentally rewarding multiple offers of behaviors that were not prompted. This is where I think luring can really help uh, balanced trainers kind of uh, not make that mistake. You know, if a dog starts to offer Offer, just steady them, you know, lure them to the right position or make them stay or just help them kind of hold their hand. This is going to lead me to a story that happened to me. Gosh, I must have been like 23 years old. I was a uh, judge for a mock trial at an AKC event. And this is where ideology uh, really conflicts sometimes with kindness and common sense. So I had one of the entries come in and she was entered in utility. She did her routine and now it was time for the send away where the dog runs between two jumps and then is directed over the jumps. This is a t difficult exercise because the background is often really um, changing and vague. There's no clear post. So this dog came in. Um, she informed me right away that, you know, she was R plus and I could see, you can just tell a lot of the times and she set up for that directed send out and the dog couldn't get it. Um, over and over and over this dog tried so many different things and my heart just like broke for that dog you know like who wants to be failing over and over and over and you could see the dog getting so defeated and it's like in that moment I just wanted to shake the girl and go grab her collar and take your hand and show her where to go like what so I think when the ideology takes over that it's never appropriate to kind of show a dog um, what to do I think that again for people not proficient in shaping and, and don't know how to avoid that I don't think it's a bad thing to just let trainers know hey if your dog starts like you know you can see that they're kind of spinning out of control or they don't know what to do hold their hand just show them what to do it's not the end of the world especially every once in a while I I think that's better than allowing that dog to go down that road of failure. Hey guys, no matter who you are and how you train, I know that you got to the point you're at today because of 
a myriad of factors that you likely had no control over. What you can do to kind of break out of that and have some free will is recognize where you are least comfortable. Where are you least comfortable? And then go to the best trainer you can find and try to learn because that's how you grow in your tools. That's how you open your mind to realizing that not everybody thinks how you do and there might be things that you haven't thought about. So if you're a balanced trainer and you're a little uncomfortable with shaping, I encourage you to learn as much as you can and become that best dog trainer version of yourself.